Good afternoon. Welcome to the Flagler Museum's annual Christmas lecture. My name is John Blades. I'm the director of the Flagler Museum, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all here, including those who have joined us online. All of the museum, museum's lectures are webcast live, uh, so if you happen to be out of town for one of the lectures during the season, please feel free to join us via the internet for a live experience of the lecture. You get to see the same slides you'll see today. For example, for any lecture, you can see the slides just like the uh, audience that's present uh, would. And you'll be able to even submit questions so you can ask questions. It's uh, fairly interactive. We also capture all of our lectures, by the way, and add them to something we created a few years ago called the Gilded Age History Channel. It's a collection of uh, video lectures uh, and videos of, about uh, America's Gilded Age. There are well over 100 videos there. You can get a nice little education on this period just by visiting the Gilded Age History Channel online. Um, let me just take a second to remind you, if you've got anything on your person that can make a beep during the lecture, this is your chance to turn it off. So cell phones, I guess pagers are, just don't exist any longer, so we'll skip that. Cell phones. And if you happen to wander in with one of the audio tour ones, this AV system can actually activate the internal alarm on that audio tour one. So please hold that up so the staff can come collect your audio tour one. Um, for all those of you who lecture, you know how disturbing it can be to have one of those alarms go off uh, or a cell phone go off in the middle of the lecture. We want to certainly prevent that. Uh, I want to take just a second to thank our lead sponsor for the Christmas lecture. It's BMO Private Bank. Uh, it's because of good sponsors like BMO Private Bank that we can offer many of the programs we do here at the museum. We're pleased they've been a sponsor of this uh, Christmas lecture for many years now. We're pleased to have them as a sponsor. I also want to take just a minute to thank the education director and her staff for pulling this lecture together. There's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes to prepare for this lecture and to make things go relatively smoothly. Um, our lecturer today, Mary Miley Theobald. Do you always use all three names, Mary? Okay, see? Well, Mary Miley, and you'll know why that's important in just a minute. Mary Miley Theobald was born at West Point. She's a self-described army brat. She went to the College of William and Mary, and she, for years, was a professor of American history and museum studies at the Virginia Commonwealth University. You can find out a lot about her at her own web website, which is simply marymileytheobald.com. She worked at Colonial Williamsburg for how many years, Mary? 20, 10, 15? She sort of still works there. That's part of the problem. In fact, she, um, she's written about 200 magazine articles, many of them about Colonial Williamsburg. She does podcasts on history, uh, history's myths, for example. I, I listened to what she did for Colonial Williamsburg not long ago. She's written all kinds of books, dozens of them, and covering a variety of subjects. She's very versatile. So, for example, she's finishing up, I think, her fourth book in a series about roaring, the Roaring Twenties. They're, they're mystery, uh, historical mysteries about the set in the, in the Roaring Twenties. She writes those, by the way, under the name Mary Miley. So if you're looking for those, just leave off with Theobald. You'll find her books, or you, easier yet, just go to her website. And she just finished a book about the Virginia Governor's Mansion. Uh, as well. Um, and then even books about things like uh, what to do with the stuff you might inherit. In fact, she calls it Stuff After Death. Is that the name of the book? <laughs> and of course, she's written books and articles about Christmas. We've invited her here today to lecture on uh, Christmas ornamentation and decoration during America's Gilded Age uh, as a prelude to our annual Christmas tree lighting here, which always happens the first December first Sunday, excuse me, of every December each year. We've been doing this now. I think this is our 55th time we've lit the tree, so it's quite a tradition here. And I'm glad you're here to enjoy the ceremonies with us and enjoy the Christmas lecture. Please welcome Molly Miley Theobald to the museum's annual Christmas lecture. my glasses or not, but I have them here just in case. Everyone, it seems, has heard 
um, that the Christmas tree is an old German tradition that dates back to the uh, pagan festivals uh, during the Roman Empire era. And the truth is actually less well known. The Christmas tree was a minor German tradition that um, did not spread to even all of Germany till after the 1750s. It, it um, came from the Alsace region of France and Germany. And no records exist at all from the Middle Ages uh, that, that mention a Christmas tree. Uh, any kind of a decorated tree. But there is an old tradition um, called a paradise tree that some people point to as a plausible ancestor. The paradise tree was a standard stage prop in mystery plays or religious plays of the Middle Ages. Um, the story of Adam and Eve uh, always had a tree on the stage that was hung with some red apples. Uh, it, and this had to do with Christmas because um, the traditional um, date for Adam and Eve's birthday, this seems a bit of an oxymoron here, but um, was December 24th. So the mystery plays about Adam and Eve would be scheduled for you know, the, the time just before the Christmas season. Um, so there are some who see the paradise tree as a precursor to the Christmas tree, uh, and they say, well, the apples are the precursor to our ornaments. Um, this has sort of weak logic, but uh, there's absolutely no proof, but I throw it out there just to, just to acknowledge that there is some possibility, I guess. Uh, the historians are kind of a troublesome bunch. Um, they always want documentation. And the earliest documented hint of a Christmas tree comes from 1561. A uh, sternly worded Alsatian, again German, document that prohibited anybody from having a Christmas tree of more than one bush. You couldn't have more than one bush of more than eight shoes length. Now, whether this was a fire precaution, a religious prohibition, uh, uh, some sort of a conservation measure, or something entirely different, we will probably never know. Um, eight shoes length, pretty much eight feet, and you were only going to have one. But one thing we do know is that you don't pass laws unless people are doing something. So obviously there were people who were disturbing others by their excessive Christmas tree height and, and <laughs> number, and the law was uh, aimed at them. A few decades later, in 1605, which is just one year before the English set sail for Jamestown, first settlement in Virginia, in English North America, uh, that comes the first description of a decorated Christmas tree. Again, same region, Alsace. At Christmas, they set up fir trees in the parlors at Strasbourg and hang roses cut out of many colored paper, apples, wafers, gold foil, sweets, etc. The custom spread slowly among the wealthy, uh, the upper class Germans. Uh, it was certainly not common certainly not in average homes, and nor was it popular with everyone. Uh, one German minister in Strasbourg deplored the practice. He said, among other trifles with which the people often occupy the Christmas time, more than with God's word, is also the Christmas or fir tree, which they erect in the house and hang with dolls and sugar and thereupon shake and cause to lose its bloom. Where the habit comes from, I know not. It's a bit of child's play far better were it for the children to be dedicated to the spiritual cedar tree of Jesus Christ. So it's an early version of Scrooge. <laughs> so the legend um, that the Christmas tree came to America with the German immigrants is really less true than meets the eye. Uh, not all Germans celebrated Christmas at all, uh, and relatively few of those who did came from the parts of Germany um, where Christmas trees were, were used. I mean, we, the, the kind of Germans we had in Pennsylvania and um, Virginia, the early German settlers, didn't tend to come from this Alsace region. So it wasn't really a very common tradition, even among the Germans. Now, there are some references 
to uh, Christmas trees in America, each competing to be the first in the state or the first in the region. This one, for instance, is um, a drawing from dating from either 1812 or 1819. It's kind of illegible. Um, a sketch from Pennsylvania a German by a German immigrant, John Lewis Krimmel. Um, and every state and region has its own story. This was the first Christmas tree here, and this was the first there. But even, even the trees that were here in the early 1700s, this was just a quaint German custom. It showed no um, propensity to spread to the rest, to the American, you know, to, to, to grow at all. Um, but when Queen Victoria uh, and her German-born husband, Albert, um, arranged in 1841 for a fir tree to be brought from his homeland and decorated, it created a minor uh, sensation throughout the English-speaking world. Everyone knew about Queen Victoria's Christmas tree, thanks to a modern, new uh, device known as the magazine. <laughs> this spread the word. Um, a print of the royal family like this appeared in uh, Illustrated London News in 1848, and then in Godey's Ladies' Book in 1850, and it was reprinted again about 10 years later. Uh, it was a six-foot fir tree, sits on the table, as you can see. Each tier is laden with a dozen or more lighted wax tapers. An angel uh, with outstretched arms is at the top. Gilt gingerbread ornaments and tiny baskets filled with sweets hung from the ribbons, uh, hung from with ribbons from the branches. And clustered around the base of the tree uh, are dolls and toys. Here's another version, a colored version. It came out a few years later, and we know a few years later because count the children. <laughs> Back here, I think there are what, four? More children. In 1855, Charles Dickens describes a tree that sounds remarkably like the Queen's or some other wealthy family's uh, indulgence. In typical Dickens, it's um, overwhelmingly detailed. And I urge you to see if you can, uh, some of these things that decorate this tree are things that you would never have thought of in a million years. It's, I have been looking on this evening at a merry company of children assembled around that pretty German toy, a Christmas tree. The tree was planted in the middle of a great round table and towered high above their heads. It was brilliantly lighted by a multitude of little tapers and everywhere sparkled and glittered with bright objects. There were rosy-cheeked dolls hiding behind the green leaves. There were real watches, with movable hands at least, and an endless capacity of being wound up, dangling from innumerable twigs. There were French polished tables, chairs, bedsteads, wardrobes, and eight-day clocks and various other articles of domestic furniture, wonderfully made in tin at Wolverhampton, perched among the boughs, as if in preparation for some fairy housekeeping. There were jolly, broad-faced little men, much more agreeable in appearance than many real men, and no wonder, for their heads took off and showed them to be full of sugar plums. There were fiddles and drums. There were tambourines, books, work boxes, Paint boxes, sweetmeat boxes, peep show boxes, all kinds of boxes. There were trinkets for the elder girls, far brighter than any grown up gold and jewels. There were baskets and pin cushions in all devices. There were guns, swords, and banners. There were witches standing in enchanted rings of pasteboard to tell fortunes. There were teetotums, humming tops, needle holders, real fruit made artificially dazzling with gold leaf. Imitation apples, pears, and walnuts crammed with surprises. In short, as a pretty child before me delightedly whispered to another pretty child, her bosom friend, there was everything and more. <laughs> Victorian era trees were not just for admiring, they were an activity, and usually the climax of a children's party. Uh, it involved um, camp lighting the candles, and then the guests were, the doors were thrown open, the guests came in to ooh and ah, and when it, then they, put the candles out, and then someone, usually the father, uh, would pick off the ornaments and pass them around. And in some instances, each ornament had a name or short verse um, attached to it, and in others, uh, it was left to the discretion of the distributor. Uh, this is yeah, here's an example of the father passing out the toys, 
or, or ornaments. Um, little, little paper cornucopias like this were filled with sweets and cut out cookies and, and polished apples were devoured. Uh, the toys and trinkets were taken home. There's another father. Uh, this is a Winslow Homer, by the way, from uh, 1858. Uh, and, and everything, of course, the, the candles are all extinguished and the trees safely removed. So it was an event. It wasn't something that stood up in the house for weeks like we do today. Now, Prince Albert's Christmas tree certainly caught the public's imagination, but it was not the first Christmas tree in England, as is commonly thought. Queen Victoria had actually seen one when she was a child, uh, in, a little girl, in 1832, uh, as a little princess, and she had written in her diary that her Aunt Sophia had set up two trees hung with lights and sugar ornaments, all the presents being placed round the tree. And long before that, in 1789, Queen Charlotte, the wife of George III, who was the last king of America, uh, set, sent to her native mecklenburg strelitz in northern Germany for a Christmas tree. And the Queen's physician, John Watkins, described it. A charming imported German custom, he wrote, with bunches of sweetmeats, almonds, and raisins in papers, fruits and toys most tastefully arranged on its branches. Well, charming it may have been, but it didn't stick. It, more than three generations would pass before the Christmas tree custom took root in England and from there came to America. So once the royal seal of approval had been placed on the Christmas tree, um, the practice spread throughout all English-speaking, first in England, of course, and then to other English-speaking countries like America and then in Australia, and to a lesser extent to some other parts of the world. Upper-class Victorian Englishmen wanted to emulate the royal family, and Americans wanted to emulate upper-class Englishmen. So it, it spread very, very quickly, especially with the magazine pictures showing the way. One thing that did not spread, this is the most curious picture, um, was the way of cutting the tree. You see what they're doing? They're, nobody's carrying an ax in this picture. They dug it up. I can't imagine why. It's the only time I've ever seen that. Uh, late in the century, larger floor-to-ceiling trees replaced the tabletop tree. And in 1909, the US Forest Service estimated that 5 million <coughs> trees were cut in America for families, which was been about half the families in America would have a tree. That's an amazingly quick adoption rate for something that really only caught on in, in the middle of the 1800s. So as I said earlier, um, there had been Christmas trees in America before the Queen Victoria Media Blitz, but virtually all these had involved Moravians, which is now the Czech Republic, or Alsatians, which is now France, but has been Germany, uh, or some other German Americans. And the custom had shown no signs of spreading um, beyond those narrow ethnic boundaries um, to other, to, you know, to, to the main population. The writer of one article in 1825 in the Saturday Evening Post mentions seeing decorated trees in the windows of many houses in Philadelphia, a city with a large German population, and he wrote, their green boughs were laden with fruit richer than the golden apples of the Hesperides or the sparkling diamonds that clustered on the branches in the wonderful cave of Aladdin. Most of the ornaments were edible. Gilded apples and nuts hung from the branches, added marzipan ornaments, sugar cakes, um, miniature spice pies, spicy cookies cut from molds in the shapes of stars or birds or butterflies or flowers. The first Christmas tree we know of in Virginia came courtesy of a German-born um, professor at the College of William and Mary, and I bring it to your attention because we have such a vivid first-hand account of its decoration. And the following photos that I'm going to show you are Colonial Williamsburg's recreation of that event, the 1842 event. And they're over the years, they do this every year as a, as a special program. So, um, the origin, unfortunately, we don't have a, a younger picture of Dr. Minigerod. He was Charles Frederick Ernest Minigerod, and a native of the German state of Hesse, when he was a young college student, he took part in an uprising against the repressive government in 1834 and spent the next five years in prison. 
uh, wisely fleeing to America on his release and making his way to Williamsburg where he got a job teaching Latin and Greek at the college. Um, the young man struck up a lifelong friendship with uh, Judge Nathaniel Tucker, who lived just a block down the street, and he became a great favorite with the whole family. The young Tucker children nicknamed him Mink. And when the judge invited him to spend Christmas with them in 1842, he was glad to accept. And probably feeling a little homesick for his native land, he asked the judge if he could prepare a, for the children a, a Christmas tree after the German custom. So he cut off the top of an evergreen, he brought it into the parlor and showed the Tucker children how to make decoration with strings of popcorn and gilded nutshells and colored balls of paper and baskets of bonbons and candle stubs wired to the end of branches. Word of the beautiful Christmas tree spread fast and there were several parties in the neighborhood um, as the children and young cousins came from miles around to see this marvel. Martha Page Vandergrift was one of these children. She came for a visit when she was 12 years old to see her cousin Chick. She recalled the event years later in the 1920s when she was 95 years old. And she said to the newspaper reporter, he, meaning Minigarod, he said his holiday wouldn't be complete without it, and he wanted Chick and me to see one for the first time. He set up an evergreen in the sitting room and decorated it with candles and bits of bright paper. And way at the top of the branches, he hung a gilded star. We children danced and shouted for joy when those candles were lit one by one. We've never seen anything in the world so beautiful. I've never had a merrier Christmas than that one, never, ever. And I've had 95 of them. Mrs. Vandergrift was right on the mark when she said that the judge enjoyed it as much as the children because every year thereafter, he continued the tradition, which for the rest of his life, and that sort of marks the point where the German tradition um, seeps into the, the American tradition and becomes more, uh, more of an American uh, custom. Now by mid-century, Christmas trees were spreading into other homes with no known German attachment. Robert E. Lee's children enjoyed a tabletop tree at their quarters at West Point, New York, when their father was superintendent of the military academy. That was a few years before the Civil War. In 1856, um, President Franklin Pierce was the first president to set up a German tree in the White House. And, this, and in Washington, D.C., the center market was where you went to buy greens and trees. And since those trees came by the wagon load from Virginia or Maryland, the first tree, first Christmas tree at the White House must have been from one of those two states. Uh, now this picture is from New York, the New York market. I don't have one of the Washington one, and it dates from about 1885 to 1895, and I expect that one in Washington looked much like it. Judging from the period photos like these and prints, um, African Americans dominated the business of providing trees and greenery. Another print dating from 1875 from Harper's Weekly. Um, during the worst winter of the Civil War, um, President and Mrs. Jefferson Davis de de decorated a Christmas tree and took it with presents to the Episcopalian Orphanage. Um, this is the recreation of that tree that's done every year at the uh, White House of the Confederacy. I should have back up. I wanted to point out this is such a pitiful print. I always look at the child uh, on the right. He's got bare feet, and this is in December, and it's in Richmond which we aren't that cold in December, but we're pretty cold in December. I don't like seeing a barefoot child. <laughs> Newspaper um, and women's magazines continue to spread the Christmas tree tradition, such as Ladies Home Journal and the ever popular Godey's Ladies Book. And pretty soon all ethnic groups and classes were were experiencing a Christmas tree in some fashion. Um, the ever popular Ladies Godey's book, backwards Godey's Ladies book, uh, ran a story that described the dressing of the Christmas tree with detail enough for anyone to follow. This story is the first to tell of a tree reaching from floor to ceiling. Listen and see if you think this would work. 
Put green baize fabric, then tack, tack that down on the floor. Put a large ceramic jar in the middle, and the tree is going to be held in place with wet sand and the whole base covered with green chintz to conceal the jar. That will never work. And you know that isn't going to work. That sand is not going to hold a floor to ceiling tree. It's going to tip over. So I don't believe anything in this article. Anyway, it goes on to say, a cushion of moss surrounded the base of the tree and presents were uh, placed on the moss. Pieces of fine wire were passed through the bottom of tiny tapers or candle stoves and twisted under the branch to fasten them to the tree. A drop of alcohol on each wick would make it light more quickly when the time came, but first the tree must be decorated with long strings of bright red holly berries, threaded like beads on fine cord, festooned in graceful garlands from the boughs of the tree, with bouquets of paper flowers, tiny flags of gay ribbons, stars and shields of gilt paper, lace bags filled with colored candies, and knots of bright ribbon. On this particular tree, the parents also contrived to place um, several dolls for the girls, and for a boy, a large cart with two horses drove gaily among the top branches as if each steed possessed the wings of Pegasus. Wooden animals romped on the moss, and at the very top, an empty gilded bird cage waited for the canary that was to be one child's gift. Now, reality was a lot less elaborate than this, especially during the Civil War when, when few people had much of anything to celebrate. And as this uh, print shows, this is a very scrawny little tree in the corner without much on it or around it. It was not until after the Civil War that the Christmas tree custom really started to flourish wi widely in the United States, and then when the Christmas tree and Santa Claus gift giving and the reading of Clement Moore's poem, Twas the Night Before Christmas, um, those began to take over the Sunday school programs. For many children, and most adults as well, the first time they ever saw a decorated Christmas tree was at Sunday school, not at a house. During the last quarter of the 19th century, Families had Christmas trees at home, um, and they loaded them with small toys and edible ornaments, almost always gingerbread. And they usually placed a star or angel at the top. Tiny American flags um, added to splashes of patriotism, and blown glass ornaments were imported from Germany, um, and they made their first appearance in 1870. This is a Library of Congress photo that dates from about 1929, but it's the earliest I've found. Um, a New York glassblower, William DeMuth, started making them himself in 1871, so you could get American made too if you so desired. And the dime store mogul, F.W. Woolworth, began importing large quantities of German ornaments like these in the 1880s, and so they were quite ubiquitous and quite cheap. Uh, they were tied to the tree um, it, it, with string or thread or whatever until hooks were invented in 1892. I would have hated to be tying all those onto the tree and, and then untying them when you were ready. So I think that's a, a marvelous invention, the hook. By the time Benjamin Harrison served as president, the decorated Christmas tree had become widespread, and President Harrison explained it in 1893, I am an ardent believer in the duty we owe ourselves as Christmas to make merry to children at Christmas time, and we shall have an old-fashioned Christmas tree for the grandchildren upstairs, and I shall be their Santa Claus myself. If my influence does for aught in this busy world, let me hope that my example may be followed in every family in the land. Notice his use of the words, an old-fashioned Christmas tree. This is when the decorated Christmas tree was no more than 50 years old in the United States. It's hardly some ancient custom, but it had become adopted and adapted very quickly. Uh, I wanted to show you this picture because it illustrates the transition uh, from a Victorian activity tree to more, today's more static tree. Um, the, these people had it both ways. They had the curtains in front so they could open the curtains for the big event and do the party and the, the tree unveiling, so to speak. And then, and then yet it was still up and decorated. And so it's, it's, 
And it's a six, it's the full height tree that we're, so we're seeing now. These next black and white show, pictures I'm going to show uh, all came from the Library of Congress. Uh, sometimes they have a date on them or a little bit of information. More often it's very, very vague. They'll say like 1905 to 1950. Well, thanks. <laughs> That's not much help. But I'll, I'll tell you what I know about them as we, as we go. Um, tree lights were the one ornament that appeared on every tree. More, most often, thin candles that were called the called tapers, were wired to the tips of the branches and held upright, more or less, um, by a counterbalancing weight. This is a terrible example of what, this is not the way they looked. Um, a taper, yes, those are tapers, but actually they're a little thicker than tapers. It would be a, a, the bottom part of a taper, you have to, you know, this much maybe on tapers. And, and yes, they often needed some sort of weight or something, otherwise they would flop, and you can't have a flopping candle. So uh, this is not a good example. This is much better. Smaller and, and upright. Imaginative people could make their own lights. You didn't have to have candles. You could get an eggshell, a walnut shell, or pressed glass, little cups, and put a few drops of oil in it and a tiny wick. And that would light and it would burn for a, a, maybe a minute, whatever. It was just a very, very short time was all that was needed. If you could afford store-bought lighting, um, you might have, there were, you could get something like an assortment of little tin lanterns that you could light with candles inside, or, or miniature oil lamps with a little glass globe or something very elaborate. But one tree um, I read about in New York, city in a church in 1859 was lit by 200 gas jets and just saying that makes me nervous <laughs> i can't imagine what anyone was thinking um, safety concerns fueled the search for less dangerous alternatives the big break came with edison's invention of the electric light bulb in 1879 electricity came with its own risks of course especially in the early years when it was pretty much a do-it-yourself affair, um, but it was far less dangerous than open flame, oil, or gas jets. So within about three years, the first electric tree lights had appeared. Credit for the invention generally goes to Edward Johnson, who was a, an Edison colleague, and he was vice president of Edison's electric company. And at Johnson's house uh, in New York on Fifth Avenue, he rigged up an electrified rotating tree that stunned visitors. Interestingly, the colors first associated with Christmas were not red and green. L listen to the description. It's, this is an actual picture of it. It's the least impressive thing I've ever seen, <laughs> but it seemed to really make an impression on people. It was brilliantly lighted, wrote one visitor, with many colored globes about as large as an English walnut and was turning some six times a minute on a little pine box. There were 80 lights in all, encased in these dainty glass eggs, and about equally divided between red, white, and blue. As the tree turned, the colors alternated, all the lamps going out and being relit at every revolution. The rest was a continuous twinkling of dancing colors, red, white, blue, white, red, blue, all evening. By the 1890s, tree lights were all the rage among the rich, who after all were the only people likely to have electricity needed to, uh, to, to plug them in and, and money to spend on such innovation. And an advertisement in Scientific American magazine at the turn of the century claims, no danger from the lights on Christmas trees when Edison miniature lamps are used. The ad says, lamps can be either bought or rented at low cost. But like most advertisements, that's a real stretch. Uh, in truth, they were very expensive. So was the electricity needed to light them. Uh, one 1903 ad priced one string at $12. Well, that's an average week's wages for a working man. Uh, the price soon fell, and here's one for $3. But if you can read the fine print, you get eight lights on a strand. It's going to be expensive. Uh, Sears Roebuck offered them in 1907 for only $4.67. Uh, 
but that, when I plug that into my little calculator to take care of, you know, inflation, it's about a hundred and twelve dollars strand. So you can see that tree lights were way out of reach for most American families. And as for installation, that was do it yourself too. This is probably my favorite picture. Do you see how they, you see that? That's, they put the light, they hooked it up to there. That's the wire that's going up. The ads claim anyone can readily wire and put up the lamps if there is electric current in the house. Right. This is the day before there were plugs on the walls. You had to find, you know, hook it up to a, 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 an existing lighting fixture. So this um, dates from 1919, by the way. Uh, whatever the cost or the difficulty, Edison's miniature lamps enjoyed brisk sales from those who wanted to enjoy their tree without standing nearby with a bucket of water in nervous anticipation. And by the Roaring Twenties, the increasing availability of electricity and the decreasing cost of lights uh, brought the electric lights down to a point where some, some people could start to afford them in the middle class. This Christmas tree is interesting. It dates from 1900 and was at the um, Wright family, as in the Wright brothers in Ohio, and I like that one. This is one, um, this is from a 1907 magazine. It gives a little poem, but it shows very clearly what kind of, what ways you might decorate your tree. And this is 1921. This, we actually know this is the Secretary of Labor, James Davis. Should we all remember him? I know, but it's interesting. Look at this one. There are several from this family, the Dickey family, and they all crunch up against the top of the ceiling. I don't know why they didn't cut off a little, but they just mash up against the top. Um, this, this dates from 1919. We know that this is Madame Reiser. Don't know anything about her. But this is what her tree looked like in 1922. And another one from that same year. I like to look at the toys underneath. What, what I've noticed is our idea of the triangular or conical, I should say, shaped tree is, is relatively new. They just had a big tree. It didn't, didn't get pointy at the top as they trim, all our, ours now are trimmed that way. And in, 19, in the 1920s, a new um, sort of decoration came, came to America, uh, which originally came from Germany. It was tinsel. Uh, this was made of silver and first appeared in Nuremberg, actually, in 1878, but it was long, longer getting to America. Now, the problem with silver, as all you will know, is it tarnishes. So pretty soon, you've got black little strands hanging from your Christmas tree that don't sparkle at all, so that's not too appealing. So they often made them in, with lead. And um, that's kind of heavy, but... <laughs> And lead and silver, you know, but those were used commonly for um, tinsel until the middle of the 20th century, so many of you may have, have uh, come into contact with that without realizing it. Um, again, another tree from the 20s. And this one I came across when I was doing the research for the book I wrote on the 200th anniversary of the Governor's Mansion in Virginia, which is the oldest Governor's Mansion in all 50 states. Um, and this is uh, Governor Trinkle's tree in 1925, and little Billy is standing out front. Look how they do their tinsel. I mean, uh, what you want? This is this is not much of an effort. <laughs> I spent a lot longer on my tree. Anyway, there's a bad story to go with this. Um, a few days after this picture was taken, 
somebody handed, as the nurse was taking away all the toys, somebody handed little Billy a sparkler. And you all know what happens when a spark touches a dry tree. It doesn't burn, it explodes. And the tree exploded. Um, it burned the 1907 part of the mansion. Fortunately, the 1813 part wasn't badly damaged, but um, the fire, and, and fortunately, no one was killed, although um, uh, Mrs. Trinkle had to rush up the stairs through the flames to wake her 13-year-old son and get him, the boy on the right, lead, and get him to jump out of the window two stories down into the waiting arms of the firemen, and then, and then she had to jump as well. So it was um, quite, it's quite a famous, famous Christmas tree. Now the invention of electric lights led indirectly to a singularly American invention called the community Christmas tree. The very first was erected in 1912 in New York, uh, Madison Square Garden. This one dates from 1937 and is obviously, well, if you can see, it's, it's from it's in DC. If you can look in the very back, you can see the Washington Monument. Um, but crowds watched in wonder as the you know, huge tree was erected in New York and um, covered with thousands and thousands of electric lights, and people sent some Christmas carols in various languages, and over the years, other cities adopted the um, practice, and this one, and this next, again, in, in Washington, this one is from 1923, um, and even in New England, in Boston, and I think our Puritan forefathers who uh, considered celebrating Christmas a, a great sin uh, no doubt are turning in their graves when a Christmas tree went up on Boston Common as a great symbol of pagan ritual and everything the Puritans were, were anxious to uh, uh, put down. Um, and before I take questions, I wanted to show you one last picture um, because it reminds me that no matter how much you do with a Christmas tree and how you decorate it, it's really kind of hard to beat Mother Nature. That's the prettiest picture of all. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, it's going to be a little hard for me to see. I don't, go, go yeah, ahead. You set my fire. I think you mentioned the blacks, <laughs> the blacks uh, dominating the market. It got me thinking yes. about it. That must have changed over time because now you have like three parties. But what was the connection? With, why were the blacks involved? And then while I'm at it, talking about all the connections that you can make with miniaturization, dollar out, line of train, all the whole time. Well, you better stay afterwards <laughs> so we can talk for a long time. Um, you couldn't go too far. When people started wanting greenery, they, they would just walk over to the woods and get greenery. But as the cities grew, you can't walk, it's too far. You know? So people who had farms on the edge of the city, those people, a lot of them African Americans, not all, but they were truck farmers and would, would bring in their food for the markets anyway. So they're bringing in you know, squash and, and berries in the season, and then when there's nothing growing, they're bringing in in Christmas decorations, and they're still doing that. Sure, because you can't cut, you can't go out and cut your own trees. So yeah, it's just a service. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I wanted to know when the tradition started. Put a tree in Rockefeller Center. Okay, when did the tradition start to put a tree in Rockefeller Center? I can only tell you Madison Square Garden, 1912. I can't tell you Rock. Yeah, I don't know. Yes, ma'am. Um, Yeah, for a few minutes. So it was usually just for one event and then that was yes. the Yes, the a Victorian Christmas tree was a party event, like a game or something, and then you handed out all the ornaments and it was gone, taken away. That was the end of it. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, the Where did wreaths come about? Wreaths. Wreaths? Yes. Okay, let me think. Earliest, oh, I need one of my, it's been a while since I've done this. 
earliest I remember seeing wreaths, they were not, never on the outside of houses until the early 20th century, but I have seen some inside the house, like inside on a window. Um, and I'd say around the Civil War, but I have to go back. I have to look at one of my books. <laughs> I can't remember off the top of my head, but I've got that in a, in a book called Four Centuries of Virginia Christmas. Yes? No, I don't. It was the Christmas tree part of the original Nutcracker Ballet in, in Russia. Uh, what date was that? 1880s? It probably was. I'm, I'm, I'm just guessing. I don't know. No, I, I would think that probably because the Russian royal family was copying you know, German and, and uh, had a lot of German connections, intermarriage, so. I would guess so, but I don't really know. Yes? I noticed that in the house here, there are a lot of uh, paper cutouts on them, and angels and things like that. How, how far back do those go in popular? How far back do the paper cutout angel ornaments go? I, I haven't seen those, so I can't tell you, but maybe. I mean, as, as a style of ornament, how far back? Don't know. I, have, um, I, I haven't uh, seen those in uh, any, I haven't seen references to them. I've seen references to angels on the tree on the top, but cut out paper angels, I haven't seen anything like that. So. Two more. Yes. As you know, along the Williamsburg, there's magnificent decorations during the holiday period. I have often wondered if how true are those decorations to the period of colonial reference? Not at all. <laughs> How true are the, are the decorations at Colonial Williamsburg to the period they represent? Now, I'll tell you the story. Um, when John D. Rockefeller Jr. was restoring Williamsburg, uh, first of all, they had no clue that anyone would ever want to come during Christmas. They thought, who would bother to come to a place like this during Christmas? And stunningly, people did. I mean, it was restored in the 20s, and by 1930, people were coming, and they're coming at Christmas. And so, what you have to realize is in Williamsburg then and now, people live in those houses. Um, it's mostly employees, but people live in those houses. And in the 20s and 30s, it was not mostly employees. It was still people who owned the houses or had life lifetime leases. And so, although colonial Americans did not decorate at all outside the home, period, nothing. But in the 1930s, Americans did decorate. And Colonial Williamsburg wasn't in a position to say, you can't decorate at all because you live here. That, that wasn't going to go over big. So, but they were afraid if they didn't say something, there would be you know, reindeer on the roof and flashing colored lights. And so they said, OK, we're all going to decorate. We're going to have a co contest with a prize, money, a big prize, for the best decoration with natural objects. And it could be fruits or, or um, uh, seashells or dried pods or some kind. Anything natural that would have been available to colonists in the 18th century was fair game. And so that's what people use and the contest caught on in that sense. And, and Colonial Williamsburg officials have tried ever since to say this isn't the way the colonists decorated, but it's, it, you can't get that out of people's heads that this is the way it decorated. But no, in the 18th century, fruit, especially during the winter, was a rare commodity. And if you were lucky enough to have an orange from the Bahamas or uh, some late apples from uh, Maine, you, you ate them. You didn't hang them on <laughs> your door for the squirrels to eat or to just rot on your door. Uh, trust me, they would have been appalled that hanging fruit on the door would have occurred to precisely no one in, in America at that time. So. Yes, um, I noticed that uh, there's uh, some religious, some religious symbol on the tree, like the angel or the star. Yes. But I haven't seen the crash, you know, the crash? The crash. The crash, yes, she didn't see a lot of crash. No, it's not often. 
No, it's, it's not um, very American in these years to do that. So you don't see much of the crash. Mm -hmm. Question here. Um, your age, the Rocky fellow, that was 1933. That the official Rocky fellow that started, but they had it on uh, during the Depression. 1933, okay. She looked it up. She Googled yes. it. Yes, <laughs> that's what we need. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> Okay, okay. Thank you. That's great. All right. Well, I'll be here after for a while. If anybody wants to um, come up and find me, you can do that. Great. Thank you. Thank you for a terrific lecture, Mary. Um, just a couple of pieces of trivia here. Um, it was uh, by the 1920s that the C-sized light, light bulbs that we're used to seeing on Christmas trees, the ones we all grew up with, were made most popular by a gentleman named Morris Propp, whose son is a supporter of this museum to this day, which is a nice connection. And by the way, when you got to see our tree, which will light just before 5 o'clock, it's the last thing we do as part of our Christmas Day festivities. The youngest descendants of Henry Flagler will light our tree in the Grand Hall. There are nearly a thousand bulbs there, sea-sized bulbs. But a lot has changed even since I came to the museum 20 years ago. Those thousand bulbs used to be at the quite, you can do the arithmetic, seven watts times a thousand, seven thousand watts, right? We always, we worried very much about uh, how the electrical system could sustain that. Uh, but a few years ago, through the magic of LED lights, we have sea-sized bulbs that look just like they did, just like they did when we were growing up. And we light the whole tree, nearly a thousand bulbs for the power it takes to, used to take to light one 60 watt incandescent bulb. Oh, so something Henry Flagler and his contemporaries would have loved because of course they were technophiles, made their fortunes through new technologies. We're glad to be able to keep a tradition alive but do it at 60 watts instead of 7,000 watts. <laughs> um, I want to thank again our sponsor, BMO Private Bank, for making this lecture possible. I want to encourage you